with tritium steam due to the fog to clear indication to the purpose of analysis. A neutron piece of the heavy hydrogen instead of a neutron and two radioactive hydrogen H3, hydrogen 3 tritium on the ground and not just in the basement, it's around the air. Sea fog. Tritium sea fog from Fukushima. Dr. Bissler, what do we know about this water, where it's coming from, and how it's getting into the sea? Well, we've known for some time now, actually since 2011, at least the scientific community has been saying there is a persistent leak from that site. So we had the initial releases, the explosions, as you remember, the water that came directly from the buildings into the ocean. But the levels from the ocean side, as we look back at the reactor, haven't gone back to pre-accident levels. That implies a continued source. And that source is very likely, and as we've seen now in the news, the groundwater. The, the water used to cool those reactors is getting into the soils that moves its way into the ocean. That's a natural process once it's released. And it's very difficult to contain that once it's in the ground. Now, we've talked a lot, as I mentioned, about the reactors themselves. Um, I, I wonder if the way that the water is flowing, as you describe it, tells us anything about the, the state of the reactors. Uh, it tells us something about you know, the source. Right now, we're seeing uh, a different character in the isotopes in the source from the initial explosive releases in the water that went directly in the ocean. By that, I mean there's less cesium coming out than originally. And cesium is something that is retained on the soils. That's the problem on land. That's why you have to kind of remove soil to make things safe for people to rehabitat those areas. So we're finding a difference in the character. The water itself then could be coming either from the buildings, most likely from those reactor, the turbine buildings themselves. Uh, also, we've heard about leaks from the waste tanks. They've been very actively trying to pump out some of the water. And there's many, many tons stored in large tanks on site. And some of those have leaked in the past. But I think the new news is more about uh, the admitting, actually, TEPCO admitting that there are leaks in the groundwater that's reaching the ocean. Uh, scientifically, we've known that, as I said, for a couple of years now. Yeah, so I want to reiterate, uh, there isn't actually much change from what you're saying. It's just an admission that this is happening. Correct. And actually, I also like to point out that, you know, the original releases were something like one to 10,000 times larger than what we're seeing persistently today. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned, but certainly this isn't of the scale of what we was going on in 2011 in the March and April timeframe. So they're persistent. And the concern then is that over time, then, they've had a problem. They can't open their fisheries off that coast, off of Fukushima. The concentrations of isotopes such as cesium are still elevated. And that implies, to some effect, uh, additional sources over time. So this smaller source today, this persistent source, might be one of the reasons why they can't open the fisheries, which then, of course, is a economic loss of billions of dollars on top of the cleanup and a cultural loss for Japan itself. So uh, should we be scared? Should people there be scared? Should people in local countries be scared, people in the U.S.? I think the, the people who do, uh, are responsible for the fisheries, the fishermen in Japan certainly are the most upset and have the most cause to be uh, concerned for our health and uh, safety. You know, as soon as you get a few miles offshore even, uh, the concentrations are much, much lower in the ocean. So an ocean release isn't as serious for the human impacts, of course, uh, but then it does get into the local food chain. Now, those fish themselves, you know, even if they move all the way across the Pacific, as we've read maybe in the news about the tuna, the bluefin tuna, their concentrations decrease as they swim across such that the levels are really not of concern at all by the time they cross the Pacific. So, Did you mean the concentration of, of fish or the concentration of radiation in the fish? Yeah, the concentration of radiation, in this case cesium in the fish, oh, go, okay. goes down quite quickly. They use, lose a few percent a day. So you take a fish that's contaminated and move it into cleaner water, and it will quickly lose the cesium isotope because it's taken up like a salt. It goes in and out of its flesh. Uh, I did mention earlier the uh, change in character. Strontium is one of the ones of concern, strontium-90, also a 30-year half-life, like the cesium-137 isotope. And that's a bone-seeking uh, radionuclide. So that ends up 
replacing calcium in the fish bones. And if you ate the fish whole, the smaller fish, sardines and such, uh, dried fish in Japan, you would actually consume an isotope that's going to accumulate in our bones. So that actually is a more of a concern. Originally, not so because the releases were small. But over time, this might become the new isotope of interest in terms of our health and safety for the Japanese population. Uh, I just had some dried sardines in Japan. Should I be worried? Well, they have closed the fisheries off of Japan. And, you know, I tell people I still eat shellfish from Cape Cod. well feed oysters are wonderful, but I don't eat them from some beds that are closed. So what they've done there is close the fisheries that are impacted, which are the ones coastal off Fukushima. And they've monitored tens of thousands of samples of fish uh, over time. Now, I'd also like to point out that, you know, monitoring fish tells you whether it's safe, but just doesn't tell you when will it get better. That's an oceanographic question. That's an ecological question about the transfer of cesium out through the groundwater to the ocean and then where that ends up. And that's a, a, a question that we don't really have a good answer for, how long until those fish are below the levels that are considered safe in Japan. Do you trust the uh, Japanese authorities to keep on top of this, to make sure that contaminated fish uh, isn't getting to markets? Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, they have very extensive programs for sampling and analysis, the monitoring side. What I would like to see more of are things like independent scientific analyses of, you know, the situation in those groundwaters, the hydrology, the flow, uh, the radiochemistry, the different isotopes that are in that water, where it ends up in the ocean, things that kind of tell you more about the longer term fate. Is You can monitor all you want, but that really doesn't give you insights into some of the impacts until you look at more of the environmental radiochemistry, we'd call it. Now, Ken Bissler, you've been studying radiation in marine environments for a long time, going back to the Chernobyl accident in 1986. And you've called the releases from Fukushima unprecedented, the largest accidental releases of radioactivity into the ocean ever. Uh, but you've also noted that the word accidental is an important caveat. Why is that? Well, we've had other sources, like the largest by far was the nuclear weapons testing in the atmosphere that went on in the late 50s and early 60s. So on some scales, if you just look at cesium, there might have been about 400, we call them petabecquerels. A becquerel is a decay per second. Peta is a very large number, 10 to the 15. So there's with 400 of those units, petabecquerels of cesium released from the weapons testing. The numbers from Chernobyl were about 100 for cesium-137, but that was far from the ocean, and that was certainly a, a big accident. The numbers from Fukushima are less well-constrained. They're probably something like uh, 10 to 30 of the same units. So the weapons testing was by far larger, and we've also had intentional releases as part of reprocessing of nuclear fuels. People often forget uh, the Sellafield uh plant in the UK, formerly called Windscale, where into the Irish Sea were dumped something like another 40 petabecquerels of cesium, uh, by some measures uh, as large or similar in scale to Fukushima, but we've kind of forgotten some of those stories. So we have had prior releases. I'm not saying they're good or that justifies having new releases at all, but we have some things to compare it to in terms of what we expect for the long-term effects and for on health and safety. Well, I have to say, though, all in all, uh, you sound pretty optimistic about Fukushima. Well, I, well, in some ways, though, my concern is this long-term lingering source. You know, things like Chernobyl were a very short-term event uh, in terms of the major releases. This seems to have a, a lingering effect. It's not something that just happened back in April, uh, March and April of 2011, we have now for the ocean, because it's on the ocean, this continuing source. And that is, of course, of concern. Again, particularly not for my health and safety when I'm on a ship sampling right off the coast, but for consumers of seafood in Japan and the fisheries. The uh, former Japanese government was criticized for the way it responded to the initial disaster. The new Japanese government is promising it's going to step in, help solve the problem. Um, I, I just wonder if um, what the Japanese government's plan is and, and whether you're confident that they'll do a good job. 
Yeah, I think what I've witnessed in terms of the government, and I don't know the details of their management uh, of the situation, uh, but what I kind of see is a, a miscommunication problem. It all steps along the way from initially in terms of some of the evacuations. They weren't taking advantage of the information they had to tell the public uh, enough about the safe direction to head, say, in terms of the evacuation, uh, information about how long until people can return. Uh, the seafood safety issue was confounded by lowering the limit they allow in fish from 500 to 100 of these becquerels per kilogram of cesium, but not really talking about why. That was more of a political decision to build confidence that they have some of the safest seafood in the world. In fact, it led to confusion and anxiety because many more fish now were considered contaminated one year later just because they lowered arbitrarily this limit, not because anything changed scientifically. And so we're trying to kind of provide an independent perspective here from Woods Hole about the fate of these isotopes, what we know from past events, and what that means in terms of risks and, and things like that. So we're, we're trying to at least fill some of that uh, from the outside, but I think internally people have lost all confidence both uh, in TEPCO in terms of managing the situation and in the government for really communicating how bad it really is. Finally, Dr. Bessler, you've traveled to the Fukushima area two years ago, and you'll be going back to do some more firsthand ocean sampling this fall. Uh, what will you be looking for, and what do you hope the data you gather will tell us? We try and take a, a comprehensive look at both the, the waters that are uh, in the ocean, the currents that carry them, so why they might be higher or lower depends a lot upon the where they're traveling and how fast they're mixing, uh, the accumulation in some of the phytoplankton, the marine plants and their consumers, the zooplankton and then the fish. And then also the fate of small fraction of some of these isotopes typically ends up on the seafloor in the sediments. And, you know, so one difference uh, or concern too is that as you build up concentrations locally in the seafloor, that doesn't move away like the ocean currents that carry the cesium out in the Pacific. So that becomes a sustained source. And then you're looking at time scales of decades uh, because of the half-life of cesium-137 being 30 years and the time that it remains in the seafloor. So instead of having something that gets lower with time or diluted, once it accumulates in the seafloor, in fact, it can stay in place. And that's, in particular, the bottom-dwelling fish are the ones that have the highest concentration today of cesium-137 uh, off of Fukushima. <laughs> 